Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to report that a handful of days after we worked this field behind the main farm, a lot of these winter annuals, the chickweed and the henbit, are dying. You can tell that because they're turning brown. Pretty intuitive explanation, I know. I was afraid this rain would keep them alive. It does look like they're losing some color, which is a good sign. From an economic standpoint, adding a second field cultivator pass earlier in the spring is actually cheaper than spraying in the fall, although marginally. From an agronomic standpoint, it actually makes more sense to spray something in the fall and keep them from growing at all, because once they're out of the ground, they actually accumulate some nutrients from the soil, and a lot of them probably will not be released until past this growing season. Yes, it's giving us a cover crop of sorts. We're getting a little organic matter out of it that we wouldn't normally be accumulating. At the same time, we're tying up some pretty important nutrients in the top couple inches of the soil. So the trade-off probably leans more towards using a fall herbicide program to prevent this at all. I'm not expecting a particularly exciting morning in terms of farm equipment, although we are going to be getting a lot of our seed corn for this growing season, which is pretty important if you think about it. Looks like dad's already 10 steps ahead of me. He's got the tractors out that he had over here and everything. All righty, got all our seed corn for the year and now we can focus on other things. Oh, I'm just kidding. That's just a start to it. We have a few more loads of Pioneer seed corn that'll come. A lot of our beans are Pioneer. We pick them up come planting time just directly out of the treater from Bruce and Wes, about seven, eight miles north of here. So we don't have to put them in our shed. Some DeKalb and some Becks and a little bit of channel here. So I think we're just getting the Pioneer and the DeKalb today. We got another load of Pioneer in and now we're getting our DeKalb. I'm glad Dad volunteered to run the On top of not enjoying running the old Toyota forklift, I do appreciate when my dad does all that because he knows how he wants the shed organized, especially with the corn, because he's kind of in charge of corn. He knows how it needs distributed for how he's planning to plant things. And I have this knack for never putting things in the right spot. So usually when I unload it, he comes in here that day or the next day and moves everything around because what he thinks is the right spot and what I think are the right spot usually aren't the same. Although sometimes the stars align, I get lucky, and it's mostly in the right area. It only took a few hours this morning. We've got a lot of our corn. We still have quite a bit to come. For those of you who are not familiar with seed corn, these boxes and bags right here equate about a quarter million dollars worth of seed. The genetics, the traits, all of that together add up fairly quickly with corn. I mean, a lot of this stuff is selling for 300 plus dollars a bag after discounts. It does not take very much to get into that quarter million mark. And we're not even that big of farmers compared to some. There's outfits around that have got millions of dollars of seed in their shed every year to plant their crop. Obviously, there's some insurance considerations there. You want to make sure it's covered in the case of a storm, but it's important to have good genetics and it usually comes at a price. I'm going to save the extensive genetics talk for later, but I will highlight a few numbers that I'm really excited to try out this year. Obviously, on the Pioneer side, absolutely stoked to get some of the 1742Q, 117-day corn. This thing was killing it in plots last year. It's a little bit longer than we like. We kind of like to max out that 115-day range. I'm very excited to see what 1742Q does on our farm. The day length complement that we went with to split the planter from DeKalb is 6618, 116 day corn. So they should be relatively close in maturity. Although two companies typically differ a little bit. I mentioned the range of seed maturities we're comfortable with. However, the trend year in year out seems to be pushing the length of that growing season. We started putting 115 day corn in years ago. Now we're up to 117 day corn. So that trend continues. People are extending their growing season, maximizing the day length usage. I think a lot of that has to do with genetics having good dry down, but it's also fair to say that our growing seasons seem to be extending. It's staying warmer longer, 
corn's being able to dry in the field and we're able to capture more sunlight in the growing season and ultimately push yields even further. A lot of times you want to plant the longest relative maturities possible because there seems to be a bushel advantage for every day of RM you add. A few other decal products to highlight. I think we've got some 6422, we've got some 6465 in the back, and then a couple boxes of the 11135 that was really good for us last year. I'm excited. DeKalb has some really strong genetics. Bayer always steps up to the plate with good products. That's why we normally plant a pretty strong mix of DeKalb and Pioneer. I would be amiss if I did not mention the racehorse that won a side-by-side -side by a channel number last year on our farm by almost 30 bushels, and that is Pioneer 14830Q. A lot of you in the farming industry are probably familiar with this number off of its plot performance last year. I mean, it was dominating last year. And in untraditional fashion on our farm we went pretty heavy on it we've got a handful of boxes and bags of this hybrid alone because it did so well last year we're putting a lot of eggs in this basket and i know with modern genetics statistical analysis i don't think we're going to deal with the issues farmers did decades ago where if you overplant the wrong number and it doesn't perform it ends up being a disaster a lot of consistency in these products, not just from Pioneer, but from all the brands that puts a lot of confidence in pushing forward with these really high performing hybrids like this Pioneer 14830Q. Super, super excited to get that across a lot of acres this year and see how it does. On the shorter side of things, we've got 10477Q. That is 110 day corn. So kind of on the earlier season that we have 0953 AM. That's obviously 109 day RM corn definitely gonna mature and dry down quicker than let's say the 115 to 117 day corns, which is on purpose because because we are relying a lot on mother nature to dry our corn, some of our farther away farms that aren't going to on-farm storage, they're going directly to commercial storage. We like to put some shorter season hybrids out there to make sure they dry down earlier in the season. That way we can get them harvested when ground conditions are fit. And of course, when there's still room at commercial elevators, which can be an issue later in the season, especially if yields are above average, which happens a lot here in central Illinois. Yeah, that's a pretty introductory explanation and representation of the corn going on to our farms next year. We obviously have a little channel coming in, some bear genetics, as well as some Bex, which is also probably gonna be bear genetics. I'll talk a little bit about them more when they come in. I'm not gonna pretend to be as much of an expert on those. I think my strongest knowledge comes with Pioneer hybrids really love their genetics and what they've been able to do the last few years. I think Pioneer, who traditionally has been behind Bayer in the last decade here in central Illinois, may be catching up with some of these hybrids. So definitely be on the lookout for them. A lot of promise there. And it's really good for the industry to have multiple powerhouses with good genetics. I mean, elite genetics year in and year out, because that pushes every company to do better, to provide better service, and ultimately, other than maybe price point, it should be better for you and I as farmers because competition breeds great products. Let's take a quick break from the action to thank the sponsor of today's video, Factor. Whether you're on the run or maybe hardly moving, it can be equally as challenging to find the time, skill, and motivation to cook fresh, nutritious, high quality meals. Thankfully for people like you and I, Factor is there to provide exactly what we need. This spring, you can eat stress-free with Factor's delicious, ready to eat meals. They're fresh, never frozen, chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat within just two minutes. With over 35 weekly options, Factor cuts down on grocery trips and cooking, so you can spend more time doing your favorite outdoor activity or putting some more work in. Here's how easy Factor is. You get the box in the mail, you pull it out of the fridge when you're ready to eat, you poke a couple holes for the microwave, you cook it for two minutes. The hardest part of this entire process is choosing which delicious meal you wanna eat, waiting two minutes for it to cook, and subsequently for it to cool down a little bit. Here's the meal of the day, jalapeno lime cheddar chicken. Looks and smells delicious. It tastes even better than it looks, which is saying something. I could never in a million years, even with time and a little bit of experience, make something this delectable. It's just so flexible having these options available to you. We're always on the run, trying to adapt to an ever-changing schedule with work and the kids. And this is something that can really fit any need, especially if you just don't have the extra time to get the grocery trips in, and it's very cost-effective. 
If you're interested in trying something like Factor, now is the time to act. They've sweetened the deal. If you head over to factor75.com, click the link in the video and use code TRIPPYFARMER50, you will get 50% off on your first box and subsequently 20% off on your next box. That is a no-lose situation. Get Factor, try it out, and see if it can fit your life. You will not regret it. High quality meals at a cost effective price. Again, that is factor75.com, code trippyfarmer50, or use the link in the video. Thanks to Factor for sponsoring today's video. Now back to the regularly scheduled programming. Fast forward to the next day. We just took care of some piddly things, installed GPS on the remaining tractors that didn't have them already. Helped dad put another toolbox on his planter because he wants to not have to climb in and out to get his wrenches and planter parts, which I don't blame him. And as they were predicting, it is now raining. It's definitely well received. They're calling for over an inch of rain, nice and gentle, exactly how you want it. It should give us another good dose of moisture in the soil going into planting season here in the next few weeks. Because it's a hard day to be productive and everything's almost ready to go, or at least as ready as it can be sitting in the shed, I want to talk about something that I mentioned a few videos ago. We got a field cultivator out, we worked some fields to deal with some roughness in a few areas, and after that we worked some fields to get rid of some winter annuals. And I know a question that's probably going on in a lot of your minds, at least those who aren't directly familiar with farming in central Illinois is, why are you running the field cultivator if the ground's great and not going ahead and planting it? So I'm gonna try and explain that to you a little bit. Like almost any other business, farming is full of its own complexities. Although a lot of you think that the technology we're dealing with is the hardest part or getting labor and some of these other things, really the hardest part of farming is your reliance on mother nature and how she dictates the outcomes and the decisions you make on your farm year in and year out. Because there's so much variation in the weather and your microclimates every single season, we have to rely on long-term statistical data. We have to use averages to determine when the optimal time to do certain things are. And the most crucial thing we do on our farm, bar none other than going on vacation to Florida all winter, is planting. Planting is the start of every season. How you start your crops determines their yield potential moving forward. If you plant in suboptimal conditions, you can limit yourself, especially with corn. Our choice to have two different planters is a prime example of the sensitivities of the crop. Corn needs to be placed very accurately at a correct depth with as optimal of spacing between seeds as possible because emergence is so crucial to their success and large deviations from theoretical perfection can have marginal impacts on your yield that add up across your farm every season. That's why we have these super capable exact emerge units that not only singulate the seed perfectly, they also deliver it to the ground. Whereas when it comes to our soybean rig, we didn't invest quite as much money in the seed delivery system because the data has not proven that soybeans show nearly the sensitivity to things like spacing and perfect emergence. Although I'm not ruling it out, it's just not evident for us yet. That's why we don't have that added option on our row units. I only highlight this point just to show that each crop grows differently and subsequently how you manage it and move forward in the season is very important to how successful you're going to be. Corn has the highest potential for grain production out in the fields. The genetics are just ridiculous if it's treated correctly, especially early on this season. We've invested in the planter. Corn is kind of like a princess. It needs to be babied along if it's not planted in perfect seedbed conditions with the adequate amount of moisture, spacing, and of course, warm weather, that can derail some of that top end yield potential. Soybeans though, only really care about maximizing the growing season. They're like the little gremlins under the bridge that you can feed trash to. As long as they're planted in pretty good conditions with good genetics and good seed treatments, they should do what they're gonna do every year as long as the weather cooperates in the season to give you the rains you need without getting too much rain. Corn is easier to exemplify planting conditions with because of its sensitivity to ground conditions and weather. Yes, in early March, the ground conditions were phenomenal. You could have been very happy with your seed bed and planting conditions if you'd gone out there. The issue is, is when we look at statistical data and weather trends moving forward into March and April, it wasn't calling for the weather to stay warm for very long. 
planting corn in March, even if ground conditions were right, is too much of a gamble based on the data we've seen over the years because the likelihood of cool downs, which are not good for corn, and of course frost are too high to justify the expense of going out into your fields. You plant the corn, yeah, it might come out great. You get a frost, which probably isn't going to be ruled out of the equation until at least the second to third week of April, although unlikely that's kind of what people pencil in. And you could have yourself a very large accrued expense of planting tillage that you have to redo all over when you lose half of your corn or you kind of limit your top end potential by putting it in too early. Although the statistically optimum window to plant corn here in central Illinois is usually from the first of April to the third week of April, the sweet spot is kind of in that second to third week. Because we can cover so much ground with planters like this, if the ground is fit, although it's not always that way, we're not too worried about hitting that window if mother nature cooperates. One thing I've gathered from a lot of these NCGA top yield guys is how important corn emergence is. They need to emerge as evenly as possible and that comes from a good seed bed that's also warm. What these guys are doing versus a lot of farmers is they're not going the minute the ground is dry, they're also waiting for it to be warm. I think in theory that is the perfect way to do it, the issue though is logistics and the weather moving in later in the season. The logistical aspect of it is if you wait for perfection, sometimes you miss the window. And that's something we've always seen on our farm. If we wait for the ground to be perfect in every single spot and the soil temperature to be 65 plus degrees, sometimes it rains and the next thing you know it's the end of June before we're planting. So it's hard to wait on that. It's not worth the gamble. The risk to reward is not there. That's often why the first week of April if the ground's dry and the trend looks to be warmer, we'll go ahead and put our plants in the ground. Is that the greatest solution? I'm not going to argue that it is. It's just something you have to do as a farmer to make sure you get your crops in the ground. That's just the nature of dealing with mother nature I guess is that you just kind of have to take advantage of the opportunities so long as they're reasonably correct. I'm sure you're following along at this point, corn very sensitive to early season conditions. You prefer to maximize growth as soon as possible. Sometimes later planted corn does actually out yield earlier corn depending on the weather. The caveat to that, the asterisk on this commentary that I've noticed is that if we get these very dry May and Junes, Sometimes that later planted corn, although quicker out of the ground, does not get the chance to establish that root structure underground to capture moisture and nutrients. The lack of this development into the ground becomes a huge net negative for you because you're shooting for perfection. In the process, you've missed the opportunity to get your plants growing a little bit. And when it becomes dry, typically they're rooted further in the ground and they don't show the moisture or heat stress as much as their later planted counterparts. So there is a trade off there. There's no such thing as a free ride in anything, but especially in farming. You have to kind of go off the data. You have to base it on the trends to make the best decision. Unfortunately, a lot of times you won't know what the best decision is until the combines run. Your half million dollar yield monitors go through the field and they say, well, maybe you should have waited till May to plant your corn. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. That's why we just gotta look at the long-term numbers. Unlike corn, we have our beloved soybeans and our moderately equipped planter that I've mentioned so far to plant them in the ground. If they're not as sensitive to early season conditions, why didn't we plant soybeans the first week of March? Again, I just don't know that the data is strong enough to show that you're gaining anything by planting them in March other than added risk of having to replant them. The worst thing that can happen if you plant in March is that it's perfect and warm when you plant them. The seeds germinate and maybe even emerge, which is probably unlikely in March here. And then you get one of those frosts that are not out of the equation yet. You plant March beans, great. You're maximizing vegetative growth. They are a photo period plant. There's only so much sunlight you can capture before the daylink shortens later in the season and they start to reproduce and ultimately reach senescence. Because of this, people have tried planting them earlier and earlier. What I've seen statistically is that there's usually not much to be gained by planting in March versus early April, assuming conditions become correct in early April to plant them. Is there as much risk planting soybeans in March as corn? Definitely not. A lot of guys will say if the conditions are variable in March or early April and you're not sure about planting corn, go ahead and put soybeans in the ground. That is the safe bet. Genetics and seed treatments have come a long way to help add to the vigor of these soybeans 
and reduce the economic risk of doing so. Again though, you plant them early, they come out of the ground and you get a frost, you've wasted your time because if soybeans are frosted on, they will die. So that is the downside of planting them in April. A lot of the reason we've invested so much money in these two big planters is so we can actually hit that optimal window without worrying about the actual logistical bottlenecks that we run into. If we have two big planters, two big field cultivators, if we get a week of good weather, we can almost get most of our farm planted. I'm not gonna promise we can get across everything, but between these two rigs right here, it's not hard to get a thousand acres a day in the ground. Is that optimistic? Yeah, I'm not gonna argue it isn't. It is possible though. It all depends on how many naps dad has to take in his planter tractor. I don't take naps, I'm fueled by pure caffeine and adrenaline. So I move a little quicker, but my planter is a little bit less capable. So we balance out somewhere in the middle. Again, back to the data for both corn and soybeans year in and year out, the safest time to plant without a huge risk of frost is kind of in that first to third week of April. A lot of guys will hit the ground running as hard as possible if it allows them to do so. I'm not gonna rule out the possibility though that if the trend is warm in the last week of March, we will certainly plant soybeans into optimal ground conditions and we may even consider planting corn. We've done it before in March, although that was 2012 and it ended up being one of the worst droughts we've ever seen on our farm in my dad's entire farming career. So that might be a statistical outlier for being able to go that early. And you can definitely ask the boss man, although he's at physical therapy right now for his shoulder, that time he played it in March in 2012 was one of the best looking stands of corn he's ever had because it was so warm, the moisture in the soil was just right. And then of course it literally stopped raining until what, August? and we've never produced such a small crop, even with modern genetics. I mean, it was abysmal out in our fields. So you do need the rainfall, that is very important. When we talk about the statistics of it, there is another consideration, and that is actually replant insurance. There are options out there to buy up your replant coverage date. In central Illinois right now, I believe corn and soybeans can start like the 5th of April. It might even be the 1st now. They've moved it up as our climate's kind of gotten warmer and our growing season's gotten longer. So you can gamble less and you can actually even buy into March, I believe, I'm not too familiar with how that system works, to reduce the risk because your planner is not a free pass. If you look at depreciation on your planner, tractor, fuel, labor, a lot of guys are gonna pencil in probably 15 to $20 an acre cost for each time this entire rig goes across the field. Small cost to pay when you look at the grand scheme of things for its importance, if you do have to replant though, you're incurring that cost twice and you're not gaining any yield potential versus just waiting till April to plant in the first time. So there's another part of it that you need to weigh as you consider what side of this roulette table you wanna be on. Needless to say, that's like my 50 or 60 cents on the subject. Hope that provides some clarification to you all. To summarize it as short as possible, the data does not show that planting in March is the best bet. If you're gonna push anything, it's soybeans, although you're going to need to extend your herbicide program. And of course, you have some insurance concerns with going that early. I think if you're going to try soybeans, definitely do so. Make sure you're treating them very heavily and using good genetics. And for the love of the sweet Lord, do not plant super early unless ground conditions are perfect. Do not settle for second or third best on seedbed conditions if you're going to compromise those seeds by planting them this early. You've got the frost risk and you've got all the expense of running all this equipment. Try to at least wait for perfect conditions if you can. Again, sometimes you shoot for the stars and you only make it to the moon and that's the best we can do in farming. One last note I'd like to add to this conversation is that a lot of the more prevalent farm YouTubers are up in Minnesota. They're a ways north when you think of it from a latitudinal perspective. I don't even know if latitudinal is a word. It's almost effectively a completely different world. Down here in central Illinois, south central Illinois to be more particular, although we have very fertile soils like some of those gentlemen and women do, we have a much longer growing season. It's part of the reason we plant longer season corn, our top end yield potential is much higher, and we don't have these fancy drying systems or shops on our farms. It's because mother nature and our climate in general is just much friendlier on average for growing crops outside for longer periods of time and doing work outside in the off season. A lot of those outfits are also dealing with large amounts of snow, 
poor draining soils and other considerations. So their planting window effectively is actually much shorter than ours most years. We have a longer optimal window and a delayed planting isn't the end of the world for us down here. I mean, we've planted in May and June and as long as the weather cooperates, a lot of times, at least for corn, soybeans don't exactly act this way. I don't feel like we've lost the yield potential that some of those guys would by pushing planting back that far. The late frost is not something we have to worry about in harvest. Obviously, we talked about a frost in planting time, but in harvest, not late, I guess early frosts are not something that typically happen here in central Illinois. Our corn not only has time to fully mature, it also usually dries way down to storage level moistures in the field before a frost even sets in. In a perfect world, we'd get about two to three inches of rainfall here. It's the second week of March and then it would stop raining until maybe the third week of April. And I'd say we'd be in for a beautiful planting season. When things start to warm up, the ground dries a lot quicker. So excuse your perception on how much rain is a lot. And I think our soil could definitely use a little more replenishment. Although I have heard that some subsurface tiles have been moving lately. We are up to over six tenths of an inch of rain so far in this event inch and a quarter over the last few days and I think it's supposed to sprinkle a little bit like this on and off for the rest of the day. If we end this week with an inch and a half of rain I think I'll count that as a victory going into 2024 planting season. A lot of things to consider. Moisture is one of them. I'm always optimistic that when we start we're going to grow 300 bushel corn and 100 bushel beans. Yet mother nature always finds a way to humble me a little bit. My dad's the eternal pessimist on the other side of the coin. He usually thinks every year is going to be an absolute disaster. And we usually meet somewhere in the middle at our average production history. Funny how that works. I fast forwarded through the weekend. It is now Monday. It's supposed to be a fairly nice day. Get up into the 60s. It was below freezing this weekend. And then after this stretch here, the next four or five days of really nice weather, it's also going to get below freezing again. Here's the 10-day forecast in Mattoon. You can see the temperature trends I mentioned. And it looks like once we clear the 10-day, starting to pick up a little bit in warmth. 10 days from now would put you really close to that last week in March. So it looks like the weather is gonna start shifting in a way that is conducive to considering planting, assuming the long-term forecast is also supportive. The question is gonna be, how much rain are we gonna have in April? And of course, how warm is it going to be? We'll have to wait and see as the forecast continue to develop, as the weeks move on. Right now, they're projecting April to be normal temperatures and slightly above average rainfall, which interpret that however you mean. I think it means it's going to rain a normal amount. And the only normal we ever seem to have on the farm is not normal. So could be dry, could be wet. I guess we'll see what happens here in the next few weeks. We have a handful of farms, particularly some of our lighter soils that are getting a little hairy with winter annuals. Dad and I talked it over. And if the ground does become fit this week, as opposed to dragging the field cultivator across these acres, we may just go ahead and load up some generic 2,4-D and Roundup into the Hagee and go ahead and spray these fields or at least ring the outside and get the worst areas of winter annuals. Yes, this could have been taken care of with a fall spray. I mentioned in the last video or this video, I don't even remember now, that you know it's a consideration moving forward to keep the weeds off of these fields. To kill these weeds, I mean, you can do it with 20 to 24 ounces of glyphosate and maybe a pint of 2,4-D. At today's prices, a chemical cost of five to six dollars an acre, depending on what final doses you go with and what surfactants you throw in. And then you've got equipment costs with the sprayer, which some people don't pencil that in. Because that looks like a reality for the middle of this week currently, I'm gonna do some final prep work on the sprayer, which I've not done. You need to get it unfolded, start to look at the nozzle bodies, clean the tank out from the precision plant, reclaim install, there's some metal shavings. I'm gonna work on that as it warms up here into the morning. First, I gotta back all these planters out. I've shown you that a million times, so I'll skip past that part. This conveyor is so in the way right now, it's not even funny. I don't know why dad even thought we should set up to it when we had no intentions of hauling any grain. And by the end of this week, I may have it relocated if not on purpose, by accident. Ben and Jeff are both in a warm, sunny place right now, getting some much needed R&R before planting season kicks off here. So just Chris and I doing some final prep work. And to be honest with you, I've got no idea where Chris even is right now. Planting rigs are nice and lined up. You could almost say at the starting line, 
just need the weather to boot. Booting her up. Getting ready to back it out. Be nice to have the newer Hagee with the John Deere integration, full integrations. Mine's like the hybrid system, the in-between steps, which I've heard this is a very reliable machine. The reliability on the full deer capped Hagees is questionable from what I've gathered. Give them a few years and I think they'll be pretty good machines and I'd love to have that deer hydrostat. Son of a gun, I completely forgot that I took the sight tube off of this. They do have a huge order of stuff coming from Spray Parts Warehouse. Some new nozzle bodies, some new tips I'm trying out and some new hose. I could put the old one back on, it's not bad. I just forgot that I took it off. It's inconvenient because I was gonna try to put some product in the tank. When Precision Planning installed this reclaim system here, they had to drill into the main tank to get this return valve. And he said it was hard to catch all the flakes, so I'm just running as much water as I can through the bottom, out the bottom drain, hopefully. Whatever doesn't go out the bottom should get caught by one of the inline screens. Okay, I've got about a thousand gallons in the tank right now. I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how this precision planning reclaim system works, assuming it works correctly, which I'm confident it will. I'm not gonna put any nozzles on yet, though I will verify and see if I have nozzle bodies leaking, assuming I can even get enough pressure on the boom to make them leak because without nozzles on them, sometimes they don't really pressurize as well and those leaks don't show up. I know I've got some broken ones in here on the front boom for sure. Well, we gotta wait a moment for the software update. Shouldn't take too long. Well, that's a first for this issue. Do not attempt to operate machine until it is successful. Contact your dealer. That's not the user-friendly answer I was looking for. I'll cycle the key, see if that does anything for us. We're having a little bit of a GPS debacle right now. I'm looking for a 7,000 receiver to put on the Hagee because I figured might as well do it while I'm sitting here getting things ready. Dad claims we have seven 7,000 receivers, which he's in charge of that, I trust his word. Between the five tractors and the implement steering on that corn planter, that's six. So we should have a seventh one somewhere, but I can't find it. And I've looked everywhere, I've looked in every cab, and right now I'm texting with our AMS specialist, the GPS guy at Alliance Tractor, trying to figure out how many we have on our inventory or how many we've purchased because I have no idea where the seventh one is. And it'd be nice to have one on the Hagee as opposed to having to rob one from the third four wheel drive tractor that is kind of just a spare. Okay, just heard back from the auto steer guy. He said we do have seven on our account. So the seventh one is missing. I don't think it was stolen. I just have no idea where dad stored it. Sometimes you put things in places that you're never gonna remember when you go to look for them. We're gonna go ahead and try the reclaim system, effectively dewinterizing our boom, which might be a little bit premature. We're gonna go to our solution tank here, pump on, and then I think you go manual. You bump this up a couple. I believe they said you wanna run this about 10% because this is only a hybrid solution. It's not perfect. If you run the pressure too high, when it goes up against the check valves in your boom, if your pressure is too high, it will actually open those check valves and start spraying as opposed to recirculating all the way around. So I think now if I just hit this, product should start flowing. Oh wait, I gotta turn the master on. Now it should start flowing. I am seeing pressure there at the boom. It just shows 10 PSI at 35, so if I flip this on, maybe we'll be able to see if it's coming through. That's obviously too much pressure. Back it down a little bit. There, there's 30% pump flow. This is the reclaim switch they installed. If I turn this off, it's off completely. If I turn it on, it's on. If that turns green, it's sensing flow. So it is recirculating right there. So that right there is the reclaim system dumping back in. That is product that has been through the boom. So if you combine that with your regular agitation system, you're gonna get pretty good mixing to start the day. That's the point of this upgrade. Only thing that could be a little bit better, and I'm not sure if it's even possible, is if maybe it was coming into the bottom. Again, that may not be feasible. There's one of those broken nozzle bodies I was talking about. I had some issues with my boom not folding right because of my pins were broken. I didn't know it. So I was hitting the middle boom section and breaking them. I just didn't fix it after last season. I've got a ton of them in my truck right now. I don't know if I'll get to it today. 
that needs fixed, but the boom has to be on to recirculate with this precision system. Again, it's a more of a patch type job. It's not a full recirculating boom like an uh, exact apply sprayer would have. Right now I've got the reclaim system and the agitator running, so you can see it's shuffling product around. Kind of a dangerous game I'm playing right now because I put an old piece of sight tubing on here and I don't have it hose clamped. So that could shoot off at any moment. I ended up skipping ahead another day. Chris and I worked pretty actively on the Hagee all day yesterday, wrapping up some loose ends and the wind picked up to the point where this was not very enjoyable to film outside. Got new nozzle bodies on, adjusted the boom a little bit, did some other stuff on the computer system, and also made a checklist of things I didn't order or ordered wrong that I need. So something I'll be fixing in the next few days. I put some size four nozzles on here. They are the AI Turbo Twins. That is my fungicide nozzle. The reason I put it on is because if I do go spray this Roundup in 2,4-D, probably going to do it at a lower carrier volume my total gallons per acre probably be in that 10 to 12 gpa range a lot of my nozzles are sized for 15 plus gallons an acre i thought this would be the best choice for what i'm trying to do probably not the best pattern but it should give me fairly good coverage one thing i want to do and i'm going to do right now is do a spray test and actually measure the volume flowing out of each nozzle I thought visibly from the cab last year, it actually looked like my boom was not putting out an even quantity to each side. So the way to test that is to do a capture test of each individual nozzle, or maybe not every one, I'll skip a bunch of them, and see what kind of quantity I'm putting out across the boom and if it's close enough to be satisfactory. The normal methodology for doing this is just to capture it and see the volume that comes out of it. I'm not very good at eyeballing things, so I'm actually gonna take it a step further and weigh what comes out. I think it's safe to assume that all of the liquid that comes through should be the same average density. So once I account for the weight of the container, which was 318 grams, the total weight that comes through here is ultimately the amount of liquid that was sprayed. This should just give me a rough idea of if I'm getting a quality distribution across the boom. If one area looks a lot higher than others, I may have to do some diagnosing and see what's wrong. nozzle if you can't tell. I like them for fungicide because they put out such a fine mist. In most scenarios though, probably going to be a little bit too much of a drift, drift risk. I'm just going to use a stopwatch, do a minute each. I've only got so much product in the tank and I'm wasting it now. I can't just do one section. I want all sections running because I want an accurate representation of what this thing does when everything is on. Ten fifty nine. Ten sixty four. All right, I just did a quick sample of fifteen of the nozzles. I wanted to just admire that nice twin jet pattern before I shut the sprayer down. It sure does look good. Yeah, will the neighbor's tomato plants be dead? Maybe. Hopefully they don't have their garden planted yet. Which comes at a price, ladies and gentlemen. I'm no expert to this process, so hopefully I can make sense of this to myself and ultimately to you all. These are the gross grams, including my weighing device. If you deduct the 320 grams from that, that puts us kind of at an average, roughly uh, maybe 730, 740. That means seven and a half grams is a percent deviation from the norm based on that rough average. You look at these, there's a decent amount of sway in here. My system doesn't really make sense. I started on the right side of the boom, worked my way to the left. And consider this the fence row of the left side. This is the fence row of the right side. And my numbering system evolved as I went through. So I apologize for any confusion. The highest numbers we saw were in that 1080 range on the right side, that's gross weight. On the left side, we got down to 1030. So it does appear like the right side of the boom is putting on 
three to five percent more volume than the left side. There could be some operator error involved. Maybe some water dripped off the side of the cup while I was walking all the way from the left to the right side. Could be that the tank solution level was lower by the time I got to the left side. So the entire boom was putting out less. I guess I should have remeasured this one a third time. I measured these first two twice just to see. And just in two different measurements, you can see I had almost a percent and a half to two percent difference on my own. I really don't know what a good variation is. This isn't a PWM sprayer. It doesn't have a pulsating pump and individual nozzle control. This is a standard pressurized pump sprayer. It has nine sections on it. So it's got nine different flow lines to the booms. There's a lot of variation that could be created because of that turns in the line. I mean, you name it, nozzle body wear, tip wear. There's a lot of variables that are hard to account for. I'm just gonna say it looks pretty good. If anyone wants to weigh their opinion in the comments, if they've ever done one of these tests, if there's some kind of standardization you look for, is 5% too much, is 10% too much? It's hard to be perfect because this isn't a super advanced sprayer system and it's not like we're launching rocket ships. If a couple rows get a little more product than the others, I mean, it's not the end of the world. I mentioned a second ago that I thought one side of the sprayer was putting on more product last year and I thought it was the other way around. I thought the far side was over applying and this side was under applying. I always ring on my right side if I can. I usually can make that happen with both the sprayer and the planter. Looks to me though, like the inside one, the edge side was putting on more product marginally than the other side. So I really don't know what to draw from this. It's close enough that I'm not losing any sleep over it. If any of you are experts in this process, let me know. Since I've pretty much got the sprayer ready to go, minus a few unimportant things, doing a little driving around today, you can tell the ground's really grayed off. And I'm just trying to make a 60 mile an hour evaluation as to whether or not the ground is dry enough to spray. And more importantly, that it looks like the winter annuals are gonna need killed off. Keep in mind, we're still probably two to three weeks out from considering planting. Temperature is gonna fluctuate, I showed you that earlier. And it's time to make a decision on whether or not we want to terminate these weeds or leave them on top for the field cultivator to fight them. The bigger weeds get, the faster they grow, the more biomass you have to chew through. Field cultivators, although phenomenal seedbed preparers, lack a little bit in cutting power like a mulch finisher would. There's no discs on front. So getting through some of those thick patches of henbit and chickweed can be a little challenging for them. The ground does look fairly dry though, so I'm not sure that passability is going to be the limiting factor. Oh man, you ever go on a fact-finding mission and then when it's all said and done, you end up with more questions than answers? That's exactly where I am right now. We've got a lot of fields that are borderline. One could definitely say they all need sprayed, so I consulted with the boss man down in the great state of Florida. He said to just focus on the worst ones, which is pretty sound logic. He also tends to be a little more conservative than I financially. He would rather chew through 50% of it with the field cultivator as opposed to spraying it and then field cultivating it anyway. So probably just gonna do the worst fields and see what this week of possible storms brings. And if it stays wet, then we might wish we'd sprayed some more just kind of Pandora's box. Financially speaking, it actually is cheaper to spray 2,4-D and Roundup in the spring than it is to run a full fall program. And you're looking at 12 to 20 bucks an acre plus app for that versus this is gonna cost us six to $7 for chemical. Just kind of a hectic way to do it in the spring and you never know what kind of weather you're gonna have. The real negative to doing this now is because my main tanker driver, Jeff, is down in Florida as well with my dad and my brother-in-law Nate is preoccupied doing some other stuff this time of year. I'm gonna have to self-tinder, but first I gotta get the tinder hooked on. I gotta dolly down the grain trailer and then go from there.
side of doing a great job backing things into the shed is that sometimes they're hard to get out without moving a lot of stuff around. We ended up just going out the east door. It was easier than trying to finagle our tanker out. I'm not even sure how I got back in there that well. Sometimes I do good work, sometimes I don't. Brought the tender rig over to the main farm, topped off the diesel fuel tank, hopped up there, hosed out the insides through the drain plug and the pump because there was some metal shavings from them installing the sparge tube. Right now I'm filling it up with hopefully a couple thousand gallons. It'll take all the overnight period to get it done. Tomorrow I'm going to leak check it, make sure the pump works, run the agitation system, and then dump that water out. And then we'll probably think about both spraying some winter annuals and doing some trial work, among other things. I'll probably have to re-verify ground conditions just to make sure that we're not making a mess. That's something we'll do in the morning. I also need to work on that fuel cultivator over there that's having the rolling basket issues. Those are all adventures for another video. I'm going to take off everyone. As always, I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!